In the past couple of days, Russia has been on the minds of every person on the planet. Their invasion of Ukraine was bold and shocking to say the least, and has got countries scrambling to make counter moves. These days, when one thinks of Russia, they see a face, Vladimir Putin. And it is his face that is on everyone's mind now. Like him or hate him, there's no denying that he's one of the most powerful men in the world. But he wasn't always like that. Welcome to Historian's Corner. In today's video, you'll be seeing how Vladimir Putin became one of the most powerful men in the world. Very few people know him by his full name, Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. He was born on October 7, 1952 in Leningrad, Russia, when it was still the USSR. Now, his birthplace is more commonly known as St. Petersburg. Though people may look up to him now, his birth circumstances weren't that high up. His father was ex-military and worked in the factory. Putin's house was a communal apartment and he grew up there with two other families. He had a thing for spy novels and flicks, and like every child, dreamed of becoming one. But that's where you draw the line. Putin was not just any kid, and he showed this by going straight to the KGB, the Russian equivalent of the CIA, and indicating his interest to be enlisted. He got his answer. They told him to study hard and to study law exactly. Not what you expected to hear, right? Well, Putin took up that piece of advice and studied law at Leningrad State University. His tutor was none other than Anatoly Sobchak, one of the country's top reform politicians during the Perestroika era. After that, he was allowed to join the KGB and he spent a total of 15 years as a mid-level agent working in foreign intelligence. If you ever thought Putin was an all-tough guy, plenty bite and no brain, now would be a great time to reconsider. One doesn't just spend 15 years in espionage and come out with nothing. This was probably why it was easy for him to meld into the political scene when he retired from active service in 1991. The fall of the Soviet Union created a power vacuum, and Putin planned to take full advantage of it. He went back to Leningrad University to work for the city's first democratic mayor, Anatoly Sobchak. Remember him? The law professor brought him up during his pre-KGB years. There, Putin developed his political hide, learning once again from his old tutor. Putin chose to keep a low profile for the ex-professor, but he grew inconspicuously, becoming Sobchak's right-hand man. He was just too good at getting things done. Whatever one wanted, it was only a case of Putin being by his side. If he was, that task was as good as accomplished. Putin's time under the KGB had taught him a many great things, and reliability was only one of them. He was loyal, even loyal to a fault. At the time, he directed his fierce sense of loyalty towards Sobchak, and reportedly even turned down the offer of a job when Sobchak lost the next elections. Most would have thought this was the end of the line for Putin. His refusal to reintegrate himself with the political circle in Leningrad, his stubborn fealty to Sobchak, would have been regarded as insolence and foolishness. People who thought like this didn't have the slightest clue of Putin's background and the process he'd undergone to get where he was. His talents and values didn't go unnoticed, so when he and his family moved over to Moscow in 1996, he became a member of the presidential staff. Driven by his hunger for power, Putin was determined to continue his political career. His first appointment in the Kremlin was as deputy to Pavel Borodin, the Kremlin's chief administrator. It was during his years of service that he met Anatoly Chubayas, a fellow alumnus of Leningrad University. The two grew quite close as they shared certain interests and climbed up the administrative ladder. Putin had manifested traits of why he was born to be more than just the ordinary Russian a long time ago. But it was just beginning to come to the light. He could no longer operate covertly as he did for his ex-law professor, and he was working for people who were far more powerful. In July 1998, the president of Russia at the time, Boris Yeltsin, appointed Putin the director of the FSB, the security and intelligence unit that succeeded the KGB in Russia. Thirsty for more, he leveraged this position to become the secretary of the Security Council, one of the most coveted positions in the country. Though he'd attained heights most Russians would have fought to fit and settle in, Vladimir Putin had his eyes set on much, much more. 
By 1999, Putin had convinced Yeltsin to make him the Prime Minister of Russia. By all regards, Putin had become the second most powerful man in Russia just three years after moving to Moscow. Isn't that something? He was second only to the president, but that would not last too long. President Yeltsin's skeletons began to pop out of the closet. He manifested complete ineptitude in controlling the Chechnya rebellion and was known by his people to be too erratic. His ratings began to plummet and it soon became obvious that he was failing. On New Year's Eve of 1999, President Boris Yeltsin chose to resign from the presidential seat, ushering Putin in. Finally, Vladimir Putin had become the most powerful man in Russia. He enjoyed the people's admiration and encouragement for the same values that had brought him to this position. If he dreamed of being powerful as a child, this was it, the fulfillment of his dreams. But Putin was still not as powerful as he'd have wanted, not yet. He still had the oligarchs to contend with. Extremely wealthy and benefiting from the fall of the Soviet Union, these individuals had strategic sway with the public and politics as well and posed a threat to Vladimir Putin and his dreams of total control over the country. But Putin didn't act right away. He waited. A good number of the Russian populace had already fallen in love with him. Some would say he already had his cake cut out. But such a thing doesn't exist for Putin. Or he just doesn't place as much emphasis on it as others would. He ran his electoral campaigns and made promises that stuck with the electorate. In March 2000, Vladimir Putin won the presidential election. Then he reaffirmed his control over all of Russia's regions, deciding this time to split them into seven new districts. He gave each district a representative that he selected himself. He also pulled governors from the Federation Council and the upper house of the Russian parliament. Then he came for the oligarchs. Aware of the power they wielded, how far it could go and how it could affect politics. Putin doubled down on them. He closed down several media outlets owned by some of the oligarchs and slapped criminal cases on them. He made a similar move against Mikhail Khodorkovsky. Khodorkovsky was a rising oligarch that controlled a giant Russian oil company. In 2003, he was convicted of tax evasion and fraud. There is little doubt that Putin was the mastermind of these charges. Khodorkovsky was thrown in jail, his assets were frozen, and his company broken up. By doing this, Putin put the oligarchs right where he wanted them. Desperate, anxious, and scared. Theories suggest that he approached other powerful oligarchs and put it like this. Either give me 50% of your wealth or I'll throw you up in jail and take everything. He also told them that they could continue their business if, and only if, they decided to stay out of politics. The oligarchs were powerful people, but their power came from wealth. Putin was wise enough to spot this weakness and he used it against them. He made them fear him and cemented his position as the most powerful man in Russia. Considering Russia had a significant place on the global scale, Putin was also one of the most powerful men in the world. Putin continued to ingrain himself with the Russian populace. True to his word, he stabilized the Russian economy in his first tenure as president and led it to exponential growth. He grew more popular with his no-nonsense approach to the Chechnya rebellion, showing all that, that intelligence and will to act, qualities that stemmed from his childhood years, was still in him. There was little surprise when he was re-elected in the 2004 election. In the parliamentary elections of 2007, Putin's party, Union, won the most seats in the House. The results were hotly contested and investigated due to allegations of deceit and injustice. But they yielded nothing. Well, not entirely. They showed people, perhaps for the first time, just how powerful Putin had become. In 2008, Vladimir Putin was constitutionally meant to step down from his role as president. But he had no intention of giving up the power and control he had amassed. He handpicked his successor, Dmitry Medvedev who won the elections by a landslide. Putin's plan was off to a good start. Just hours after sitting as chairman of the Union Party, Dmitry Medvedev appointed Putin as Prime Minister of Russia. Check and mate. Putin had again secured his seat and the helm of the ship. Dmitry didn't grow into his position as president, 
but everyone knew Putin was the real power in the Kremlin. If anyone doubted this, they wouldn't for long, as they were about to see Putin in his full might. In 2011, just before the presidential election scheduled for the next year, Dmitry announced that upon victory, he'd switch places with Putin. He'd become prime minister and Putin would go back to being president. Where in the world does that kind of thing happen? How could the president of a country make such a claim? The Russian populace was surprised, but people who knew Vladimir Putin were not. There were controversies and protests regarding the election, but at its conclusion, Vladimir Putin emerged victoriously. It was obvious. It wasn't a case of democracy or choice. It was a matter of who was strong enough to stop him. On becoming president, Putin handed over the chairmanship of the union to Dmitry and named him prime minister. Another twist to keep himself in power. These are the kind of things that can happen when you have a former spy as president. From the start, Vladimir had always been more interested in Russia's internal affairs, and he'd spend time building up the military to strengthen Russia's might. Part of this meant maintaining the largest stockpile of nuclear weapons in the world. Many claim that Putin aims to restore things back to the old Russia of the USSR. Russia's military might rubbed the world the wrong way back in 2014, when Putin annexed Crimea, a constitutional part of Ukraine. The pro-Russian president, Viktor Yanukovych, had been ousted, and it's safe to say, given his correspondence with Putin, that his dethronement limited Russia's influence over Ukraine. Putin sent Russian troops to invade Crimea and annexed it to be part of Russia, despite sanctions from the Western world. Eight years later, Putin is shaking up the world once more. Putin has had altercations with NATO, the US, and the UK, and it hasn't shaken his mind one bit. He has now launched a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. If there's one thing that's clear with this invasion, it's that Putin stops at nothing to get what he wants. He's not scared of people, and he's not scared of global powers either. There's also a reason why global powers are a bit hesitant to act against Russia's acts of aggression. Putin has stated on several occasions that interference from the West would result in consequences greater than any you have faced in history. Many believe these consequences would come in the nuclear form. These threats must be taken seriously as they come from one of the most powerful men in the world. What do you think of the current Russian invasion of Ukraine? Is it a ploy by Putin to become the most powerful man in the world? Will Putin stop with Ukraine or look for his next target? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section. Until next time, thank you for watching Historian's Corner.